a pastor and a priest walk into a movie theater. Hi, I'm Father Andrew Miller. And I'm Reverend Michelle Byerly. And this is a pastor and a priest walk into a movie theater, a podcast about faith, life, and the silver screen. Today we'll be discussing the 1998 anti-war film, The Thin Red Line. For those of you who have not seen it, we recommend seeing it. We'll be getting into spoilers. And it is truly a war film, but anti-war, as Father Andrew said. And um, this is my first time having seen it. And it was your recommendation, Father Andrew. So um, can you tell me what resonates for you with it? Well, I love, first off, when I was on the, uh, the, the, the pod, Gail's podcast, Faith and What Resonates, the uh, music that I chose to share with her as sort of the point of the interview was the um, the song uh, from the Thin Red Line, uh, the instrumental version of Jesus, you hold him, you hold him hand long me, Jesus, you hold him hand long me, which is Christian hymn, um, sung by the uh, um, Solomon Islanders who lived on Guadalcanal, whom we often forget about when we talk about the Battle of Guadalcanal, that, oh, actually, Guadalcanal is one of the largest islands um, in the island nation uh, called Solomon Islands and hosts their capital city and um, is home to a very, very um, uh, large Christian population and was at the time of the battle. Um, and Jesus, you hold them hand long me is one of my favorite songs and, and, and one of my favorite instrumental pieces is utterly beautiful. And I think the music of the Thin Red Line, it, it's interesting, this is probably from a, a fairly um, shallow cathartic level, not so much uh, uh, the deeper meanings of the movie, but the music of the Thin Red Line is, is, is probably my favorite score in all of cinema. And it, 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 it I've, I was always struck by the beauty of music. Um, and as far as, as, as the deeper meanings of the film, I, I, I think what frames the film is the very opening line, which is spoken off screen, right? So, 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 so much of the Thin Red Line is, uh, uh, the dialogue in the Thin Red Line is not actually spoken by the, the characters as they are you know, on screen, but, but right. as they're thinking to themselves. And the very first line is, is, is a thought. It's uh, what's this war in the heart of nature? Why does nature vie with itself? The land contend with the sea. Is there an avenging power in nature? Not one power, but two. And that really frames the discussion around the movie because um, I think the film really is an example or perhaps a uh, one one side of the film because i think it, it, it the, the film really struggles and is at war with itself but one side of the film is an expression of a movement in american literature that dominated post-civil war american literature called naturalism um the fellow who wrote a red badge of courage um stephen crane is an example of this and it, it naturalism expresses the ways in which human beings are savage um, human beings are uh, um, uh, violent inherently, and um, um, th there really is very, very little redemption in, in or any very little worth re redeeming in human in human violence, and um, it, it really speaks to um, the heart of what nature is, not just human nature, but nature as as such. So, and I, I think there's really a battle between between that view in the third line and and the view that really is taken on by Private Wit, the character of Private Wit, which is the opposite view. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting this film, and and there are other films that do this too, but there's this juxtaposition of beauty and horror. Yes. Beside each other, you know that you have this setting that could be beautiful in its untarnished sense. And then here in the midst of that is, is war and chaos. And even in nature, you find that where some of nature can be absolutely beautiful, but at the same time, you have animals that attack each other. You have roses that have their thorns, you know, it, it, and it's this combination of the two, you know, and it's, it is kind of a can one exist without the other. So, and I think that fundamentally most faiths, and I think we've talked about this before, come down to this fundamental question of how do we deal with the problem of evil? Yes. And that's what this movie really deals with. Yes. 
And um, <clears throat> I do like how the film um, expresses that one way of interpreting nature is, and I don't think the film really resolves its own inner conflict, the conflict between characters like the Colonel, like um, uh, Sergeant Welsh, uh, uh, Sean Penn's character, um, and other characters like um, Captain Staros and, uh, and Private Wit, uh, who represents sort of that other lighter side. Um, I don't think the film resolves the conflict between them. I, I think that the audience is left to really form their own opinion about the matter. But Colonel, Colonel um, Tall has a very interesting line that uh, supplements the opening line of the film of uh, what's this war in the heart of nature. He says, uh, um, he, he's, he's telling Captain Saros, you're too soft hearted. You're, you're, you're just too soft. You're not tough fiber enough. Look at, mm -hmm. look at, look at the, look at, look at all these trees, look at these vines, the way they, they, they twist around the trees, strangle them. Nature's cruel, Staros. Yeah. And which that, so that line really um, hit a nerve for me because I am a person who tends to wear my heart on the sleeve a little bit more. I am a person who would be considered too soft hearted. Mm -hmm. Um, but the gift of that has been that I have learned along the way that that is a beauty and a strength, mm -hmm. not a not a weakness, as some would want to paint it to be. You know, it, it takes a lot of courage and strength to stand up and say, I'm going to turn the other cheek, for example, or to <laughs> I'm going to walk that extra mile. <laughs> Yeah. Or to say what Captain Starro said to the colonel right afterwards. Have you ever had anyone die in your arms? And, yeah. and when you have that happen, Colonel, then you can come to me and tell me I'm too soft, soft hearted. Yeah. And the other soft hearted character, Private Wit, dies at the end of the film. And on the one hand, you, you know, there's what Sergeant, what Sergeant Welsh that says at his grave, where's your spark now? And then we can talk about the idea of spark and light and that sort of thing, because that's another theme in the film. But on the other hand, Private Wit died sacrificing himself so that two of his comrades could get away. So, I mean, that, that soft heartedness really, really led to good in, in the film. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about this idea of pacifism mm. in the midst of this movie. It, to me, um, as, as we were having our discussions, we talked a lot about um, kind of some of the Quaker theology. You talked about that divine spark, which kind of actually ties in there as well. But um, I, I'd like for our listener to just kind of talk through some of that notion of, of pacifism um, because there are some branches of Christianity, such as Quakers that are very radically pacifist. I find myself becoming more and more pacifist as time goes on. There are some who very much subscribe to a just war theory that there are times and places where war is necessary. Um, difficult, regrettable. Yes but necessary. And so um, what are your thoughts on how that plays out in this? Well, I, I think that uh, Private Wit is a Quaker um, in, in all but one sense. Private Wit is not a pacifist. Uh, in fact, there's no pacifist. There are no pacifists in the film in the sense that there's no one who's unwilling to use violence. But Private Wit's theology centers around this idea of a light, an inner light, right? And in fact, uh, um, Sergeant Welsh derisively asks him in one conversation, so you still believe in the beautiful light, are you? And uh, Quaker theology centers around this idea of an inner light of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. that exists in, 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 in every human person, that spark of, of, of genius. I, I'm not sure I would say spark of divinity. And, and full disclosure, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Quaker and I don't play one on TV. So I, I'm not really sure uh, uh, if I'm right. getting this right. And oh, by the way, listeners, are there any Quakers among you, any members of the Society of Friends, please, please, by all means, correct us. But I, 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 I see in Private Wit a kind of Quakerism, a kind of uh, belief in the inner light among all people, the beautiful light that, and, and this is in contrast to the idea of war in the heart of nature. And 
and and war and in the, uh, the heart of human beings yeah. that human beings are basically good and loving and kind and nature is basically good and loving and kind and i'm gonna dogs hush 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 Shh. be cool be good be loving be kind oh go have at each other <sighs> and 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 what i would say is is that um Wit has this theology in spite of not being a pacifist. And, and in fact, Wit's the way Wit sees his, his role in the war is, is shaped by this theology in that he, he wants to do some good. He, 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 what, what he says to Sergeant, um, um, God, what's his name? Woody Harrelson's character as he's dying. You didn't let your brother down. If you hadn't thrown yourself on that embankment, we'd have all been killed. What Sergeant Welsh questions him in one of their dialogues, uh, what difference do you think you can make one man in this this whole big ma madness? So this, you know, Private Wit's understanding of, of fighting this war is that he's fighting for good, fighting to care for people around him. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and one of the themes that plays out is a victory in war sometimes being being able to come home unchanged. And I and I don't really think I don't think it's possible to come home from war and not be changed in some way. Um, I think there is just so much that happens. Um, you know, we've done there's so much work that's being done on things like moral injury, post-traumatic stress, just being in those situations that I think it would be very difficult. And so to be the kind of person who could. I think is would be a significant victory in and of itself. There's one spot in the film I think that that expresses that quite well, mm -hmm. and that is, and it's it's connected. Um, there's a character I don't remember his name, but he I remember that he carries a Thompson submachine gun, one of those little submachine guns, and um, he he he's sort of a brute. Um, uh, he he. Um, messes with the Japanese prisoners of war. And by the way, the film treats, humanizes the Japanese very, very well, contra some World War II films, which really paint the Japanese as these, you know, savages. But the, the film is very, very, it shows the Japanese is very, very human and very, very uh, not evil at all. I would have liked a little more of the voice from them, but I did like the fact that we do get some of that same internal dialogue. Um, you know, do you not understand that I'm a loved person too? I'm Are someone's, I, I can't, I'm not articulating it exactly, but the theme is, you know, I'm, I'm loved by someone just as much as you are. Yeah, you hear the voice of a dead Japanese soldier um, mm -hmm. saying, are you righteous, kind? Did your confidence lie in this war? Um, uh, know that I was too. Yeah. And, uh, but the, the, the thing is, is this, this character whose name I don't recall, um, who's basically just this brute and cynic and, you know, messes with the Japanese, uh, 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 taunts the Japanese prisoners of war and that sort of thing. Um, um, in one scene after the battle, um, he's shown to be just crying and, and in torment over, and, and, and as he's crying and in torment, he thinks back to, um, to, his taunting of this Japanese prisoner of war, his telling him, hey, you're dying, you're dead. I want to sink my teeth into your liver and the birds are going to, and, and he's just thinking about that. And, and the Japanese POW said something to him angrily, but we don't really understand what, what, what he said, but he's thinking about this and he's clearly in you know, great torment over what, what was that interaction. And, and it's at that moment that the, the inner voice, the, the, the thinking voice says, um, uh, war down to noble men, it turns them into dogs, it poisons the soul. Right. So, and the other place that I see that concept a little bit is when they're talking, it, it, it's, it's kind of slid in there, but I want to expand on it and point out the significance. So, um, one of the lieutenant colonels or whatever asks Staros, he recognizes that his name is Greek. And he and he asks him if he's read the the any of Homer, and that they read it in the original Greek at the point West Point mm -hmm. Military Academy, 
to me, he completely freaking misses the point of the of the Iliad. Because the whole point of the Iliad is seeing a muse of the wrath of Achilles. And it's all about the horrors of war, the the, the problems of ego and <laughs> our pride and how that gets us into wars. And I love how, you know, there's this in in, in that and in this movie, you know, war is young men being sent for the egos of old men (laughs) truly and i would add women now of course Mm. but um you know it is truly the people who probably are least affected are the ones who end up being sent to fight battles for people they hardly know about well and the character of the colonel in general colonel paul who is Mm -hmm. um very egotistical Uh, Mm -hmm. although the film i think humanizes his ego in the sense that it shows him where it comes from it shows him how he's essentially worked and played the politics of the army for all for his entire career, uh, only to be constantly passed over for promotion, constantly ignored. And, you know, he's his his yeah. his complaining about that in his inner dialogue is is uh, or monologue is is very narcissistic. But um, he's finally got the opportunity to do something great in in war, to 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 have his war. He tells John Cusack's character, like you, you, I've you, waited you're fifteen young. years to have my yeah. war. Yeah, you're young. You you've got your war. I, this is fifteen years. This is my first war, right? And and yet finally his his passion and his desire to 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 take that hill at any cost is really just his own his own ego, his own desire to do something great in his career. He's, he's a career minded opportunist. Even if it costs him, how many, he asks, how many men are you willing to lose? One, well, 10, 20. <laughs> yeah. And he puts that in, in, and there is, I, I do have some sympathy with that. Cause well, I'm not a, I'm not a, 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 a pacifist, not in the absolute sense. And I do think that I wouldn't call World War II a just war, but I would say that's about as close as you get to a just yeah. war. And um, I, I, I mean, yeah, it, it, I, I do think defeating the, the Japanese Empire and, the, and, and Nazi Germany was a worthwhile goal. And yeah, it, it will cost lives, would have cost lives. And I, I think you know, he's right in that sense that, yeah, it, it's important to be willing to sacrifice uh, a part of being a, 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 and of course I, I've never been in war. I come from a military family, like all of my family were Navy men, but I've never been to war. And so I don't don't know what I'm talking about here. But I imagine that that part of being a a commander, as Staros was, is being willing to order the deaths of your men. And there's some truth, the fact that Staros was not willing to do that. And maybe he was therefore in the wrong place. But he but but on the other hand, the colonel. Colonel Tall you know, puts it that way, and he's not wrong to do so, but from his inner monologue, that's not what it's about for him. It's about his ego. It's about him getting what he wants and advancing his career. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, he sees it as an opportunity more than seeing the actual human cost. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of placed further away from the action until later. You know, he's kind of, you go up that hill, you do this. <laughs> You know, I wonder if John Cusack's character, uh, I don't I don't know if he's ever named, but he has a about a 15 minute role of uh, kind of coming in. He's 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 one of um, Colonel Tall's lackeys and he he kind of comes in to take charge of that small party that goes up to actually like uh, take out those those machine gun nests that are preventing uh, Charlie Company from from actually taking the hill. And um, I wonder if John Cusack's character is basically a more noble version of, of Colonel Tall. And, the, you know, he, he's the guy who, yeah, he understands what Tall says to Starro. So you got to be willing to, to, to order the death of your men. But for him, it is more noble. For him, it is about, about the greater good. And because I see in that conversation between Nick Nolte and John Cusack, when Nick Nolte tells him it's 15 years, you, you're young, you've got your wars. 15 years is my first war. You can see this look of disgust on on john cusack's character's face right like i can't believe that i actually liked you at one point dude and and again on on all of this i do come back to you're right that i've never been in that position i've i have never been in a place where i'm responsible for the lives of my fellow comrades at arm you know Mm -hmm. um 
I, I cannot imagine the kinds of decisions that would have to be made. And I, and to me, I think that the, the most difficult part of war, the most challenging thing is that it does lend itself to the, to, in order to be able to go to war with someone, you have to dehumanize them. And, 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 and to me, it's that act of dehumanization that is what makes war so challenging or evil, <laughs> you know. And to its great of... credit, the film does not let us get away with that. Yeah. And to its great credit, the film does not let us see the Japanese as anything other than because there's a lot of prop we believe to this day propaganda about the Japanese saying well they would never surrender they have this martial philosophy of of, of glorious death and battle and they would never surrender and they would fight to the last and it is true that the, the Japanese were very reluctant to surrender at times and, and did uh, fight very daringly against uh, against harsh odds, and you know a lot of Japanese soldiers were killed uh, in in various battles across the Pacific theater of the war, uh, and very very few of them did surrender. Um, uh, but on the other hand, this this propaganda that 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 Americans um, are to this day um, inculcated with this idea of the savage Japanese. It, well, it's racist, and 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 I love how the film does demonstrate that. Well, no, the Japanese are humans, and they're scared, and they're just as freaked out as as anyone. And mm -hmm. many of them did surrender because they didn't want to fight that war any any more than anyone else did. And yeah. uh, so it doesn't let us get away. I mean, I, I I in as much as I can, from a historical perspective, support the cause of the Allies. I do like how the film doesn't let us get away with thinking of the enemy as pure evil. Because they too, I'm, I, I wonder what sort of propaganda they would have been exposed to on their side. <laughs> well, we know what propaganda they were exposed to on their side. And it actually is quite, uh, I, I, it makes one wonder how much of the Japanese unwillingness to surrender was because of some great martial discipline that they were inculcated with and how many of it how much of it was because they were essentially told to be afraid of the americans because the americans would not take prisoners in fact many of the japanese were told just that the american if, if you have any thoughts of surrender you abandon them here the americans are will not take prisoners and um although that wasn't exactly true of course we did take prisoners um <clears throat> it's uh it's also the case that um Part of the Pacific War, the, a real edge in the Pacific War that didn't exist in the European theater of war as much was the racial element, that mm -hmm. um, there was a great race hatred between the white Americans and the, the Asian Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it did not exist between the white uh, allies and the white um, Germans in Europe. And mm -hmm. um, the, the part of the, part of me, uh, there are a lot more instances of, of, of Americans, especially, but Americans and Japanese getting caught up in this bloodlust of, mm -hmm. you know, when someone tries to surrender, they just shot them. Yeah. And so there, there was some, there were some examples to justify that fear. And so I wonder if a lot of the reason why the Jap a lot of many Japanese soldiers didn't surrender is because they didn't think that if, that they'd survive either way. They mm -hmm. surrender or not it doesn't matter yeah well and i think um i'm i'm shoehorning this in but i think we need to talk about it with world war ii um i was in like eighth grade before i learned about manzanar and some of the other japanese internment camps here which we call them internment camps mm, maybe i i can't concentration camp is a loaded word but they were you know that racism existed here on the home front oh, yeah. too is what i is and 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 i say i i point out how long it was before i learned that to say um you know we need to be more open about those conversations in war there are no clean hands you know i i, I and and to say <sighs> We have to own our history there. Yes. Yes, we need to have some critical Japanese history. Mm -hmm. Critical yes. Japanese theory. Right. Um, and and it it I I know this is a tangent, but it 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 frankly scares me sometimes how much we are trying to 
avoid history that makes us uncomfortable right now. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm like, we have got to, the only way through, through reckoning with our past is to acknowledge it, name it, and move forward. Without repentance, we cannot have absolution. Yes. So what do we think of the, um, uh, the Solomon Islanders in the film? I, it, it's one of those I would have liked to have seen more there. I think um, I liked that we started there first um, and to, to kind of have a sense of um, the, the relationships and the interactions between um, the private and, and the woman who was there and, you know, he's asking, do they, do they fight? She's like, not usually, except when there's the planes around, but then they, but then even kids, you know, they get into their tussles. In that, in that conversation, I see sort of, um, uh, the audience I think is tempted to see the Solomon Islanders as natives. Mm -hmm. Um, as uh, indigenous peoples, and they are, but, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, they're they're also well, they're they're Christians. They're they're uh, uh, and well, many indigenous people are Christians, but they're they're Christians. They're uh, um, God forgive me for the racism of of uh, that's hidden in what I'm saying, or, or perhaps out in the open in what I'm saying. They're quote unquote civilized in the sense that they have adopted Western mm -hmm. economies and Western colonized. Yes, yeah, they're colonized. <laughs> But um, there's a there's a tendency, I think, in a lot of uh, a lot of um, film criticism of the thinner line to, to think of them as natives and noble savages. Mm -hmm. In other words, to think of them as sort of the juxtaposition between the warring Americans and the warring Japanese uh, and juxtaposed with this are um, uh, the peaceful Solomon Islanders. And when, actually, I think if you look at the film more closely, you find that actually the Solomon Islanders are not peaceful. I think that private wit thinks them peaceful. And I think private wit has a has a false noble savage idea of them. And 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 you know to his discredit, that's he, he kind of takes on the role of the white person who uh, who 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 dehumanizes, unwittingly dehumanizes indigenous peoples by thinking of them as being something more than human thinking of them as being mm. ideal and that sort of thing. When in reality, mm. well, that, that conversation that he has with, with, uh, with that woman, the woman is essentially saying, yeah, yeah, our kids fight. Yeah. Our, 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 we're, we're normal people. And, and then he comes back to the village uh, a little later in the film and discovers that he's not welcome there. And part of the, the reason why is because, well, he's, he's, he's a soldier and they don't like him. And, uh, uh, but, but another, in, in another way you see in that film or in that scene, two, two Solomon Islander men fighting and you see a tremendous amount of poverty. And, and, and it's like, this is not an ideal culture. This is not what this is. This is a human culture, just like Japanese and Americans are humans. And I, I think Wit realizes in that instance, I, I, I idealize these people and in a sense dehumanize them. So, yeah. And it does make me think about, you know, all of that, yes. And being a culture that's caught between two others in this mm. war, you know, and, and, and I think one of the things that I very much recognize as an American United States citizen, let me rephrase that <laughs> is that we really have not had open um, warfare with artillery and guns and weapons in in the official declared sense on our soil since the civil war you know we've had we've had terrorist attacks here and there we've had um acts of mass gun violence things like that but we we have not had to live with the experience of you know tomorrow next door may be gone because i heard bombs overnight right and mm -hmm. and i think that um whenever i i think about these stories of war I think I, I wonder if part of why we kind of ennobleize it and, and um, 
you know, kind of make an awe and wonder of it is because we've not had to, we have not had to have someone die in our arms kind of thing. You know, I wonder if that plays a factor. You know, Rachel Maddow wrote a book called Drift in which she discussed the, um, uh, the drifting apart of uh, the uh, U.S. civilian psychology who has essentially lived um, isolated from war. For, for, the, for, the Ameri- for the U.S. civilian, war is an abstraction. And mm-hmm. this is definitely the case for me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but for a large number of, of, of men and women and their families, war is, has, has not been an abstraction for more than 20 years now. Um, but because we have an entirely volunteer arm, and this is not an endorsement of the idea of the draft, but because we have an all volunteer army, uh, what that does is it creates a kind of separation between that class of people and their families who fight wars and that class of people who do not, who, for whom war is an abstraction. Mm-hmm. And I think that has helped because, as you say, we have not experienced war on our own soil really since the Civil War. Um, and I do like how you put it about the, the Solomon Islanders that they are, they're caught in the middle. Like, don't think of them as, as, as noble savages, but they're caught in the middle. They're colonized people who are essentially trying to survive between two warring colonial powers. Mm -hmm. And good God, how horrid. Yeah. I mean, think about, this is a, a wild example, but think about Canada and Mexico trying to fight over the land in the u.s Mm. and how that would and how that might feel um so this movie came out around the same time as saving private ryan and there are some film critique that kind of puts the two against each other um i wonder uh, we're not we haven't looked at private saving private ryan but um i wonder is there is there any way that we might want to speak into that comparison? Well, Saving Private Ryan is a war film in, mm-hmm. in, in this sense of it being a, a film about a, about an historical war. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's a, I mean, it's a, it's a great movie. And I, I think we should do an episode on Saving Private Ryan at some point. Um, but, it, you know, at the end of the day, I think um, what Saving Private Ryan is supposed to make people feel or lead people to feel is that kind of patriotic something similar to how to what to how Pearl Harbor ugh, horrible film uh to how Pearl Harbor makes people feel right that that oh my god look at how 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 heroic and how 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 awful the sacrifice these these young men mostly men um uh went through and in, in order to to save our our glorious country I mean at the end of the day I think that's that's saving private Ryan's point um, that's not the thinner line's point. The, the thinner line, I, I think, says absolutely nothing about patriotism. It says absolutely nothing about the cause of World War II. Uh, it, it says absolutely nothing about the thin red line, I think, is about and you know, to what ex- extent it gets it right, I won't know because I've never been there. Um, but it's about, however it, it succeeds or fails, it's about the experience of war from the perspective of the soldiers and the moral injury that is sustained from, from you know, engaging in this violence. I agree. So I was trying to make sense of this. The title of the movie is The Thin Red Line, and I'm not sure we ever really get, I'm not sure I understood where that title comes from. There's a, a a number of quotes uh, from various philosophers and, and literary uh, figures uh, that, that use that phrase. The one that is often quoted or, or appears, that, so, so it's based on a book called, surprise, The Thin Red Line, um, written by James Jones. It's an autobiographical book uh, about his experiences fighting in Guadalcanal. Um, it's actually a, a sequel, although he changed the names of the characters because some of them died in the, the first book. Uh, to to another book that he wrote about which a great movie was made called From Here to Eternity, which is about Pearl Harbor. Um, but the Thin Red Line, um, at the beginning of that book, he quotes, uh, and I don't remember who he quotes, but it's, uh, there's one thin red line between the sane and the mad. Ah. 
Interesting. And there are others that he quotes as well. There's uh, actually a history of um, uh, an actual battle in which the um, the soldiers were described as, and this was back when when soldiers would fight in literal lines, right? Standing up and in, in front of mm-hmm. each other and firing muskets at each other, they were described as a thin red line. Mm-hmm. So interesting. So this isn't probably a major theme, but I was thinking about the uh, as they were taking the mountain. What what struck me so much was. You know, one one part was the seeking was the, you know, we need water mm-hmm. and, and the need for that. The other part was how much it was like, oh, we'll take it by the end of the day. Well, oh, we'll take it by tomorrow. The, yeah. And, and then it just kind of like keeps moving those goalposts. Well, and the Colonel, this goes back to Colonel Tall's character. Colonel Tall is constantly worried. Uh, he says the, the admirals got up early for this. Right. He's constantly worried. And, and, and John Travolta's character, whom we meet for one scene at the very beginning of the film, who's a general, um, uh, he's never named, uh, says uh, uh, the admiral will be watching. Someone's always watching you. So at the end of the day, the, the colonel is so motivated to take this hill because uh, if he doesn't, someone's going to step in and relieve him of, of his command and he won't be able to, to succeed and, and get done what he set out to do. And the hell with water. We, we got to take this hill. Um, yeah. although he, he certainly makes a show of it in front of his men, he says, I'm sorry, we haven't been able to get water to you. It's, you know, we've had problems. And then he says, God damn it. I want people to get water right now. You give me three runners and you get them up here and get water right after he says to John Cusack's character, I don't care about water. Some of them in pass out, they're just gonna have to pass out, you know, cogs in the machine. <laughs> yes. But, but what's so interesting is, is it's on, it's in the battle sequence, like the battle, it goes between alternates between horrific battle, but also um, light shining through trees. And those moments where one soldier touches a plant and it closes, where, um, uh, you know, you see a snake, you see these, these, um, these, these moments of nature around them, the, the beauty of nature around them or the beauty or the warfare in nature depending on on which side you come down on oh well and 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 two that leads me to thinking about the impact of warfare on nature Mm. you know and how um places have been destroyed because of warfare and i wonder if the film misses the mark on that score because but it doesn't acknowledge that as much or no because because the it, it honestly seems to me that there that nature is used more as kind of a, a MacGuffin in the film in that on the one hand um there's one side that the audience can be tempted by to to embrace which says that the war and the heart of nature right that the vines and everything just twisting around and you know uh, being nature is at war with itself and then there's the other side with human beings being at war with each other and then you know the the light and the beauty in in nature being all around that sort of kind of unchanged by it but well of course nature is changed by war by human war so and and some would argue that humanity is at war with nature sometimes well and it's so interesting what's this war in the heart of nature Part of me wonders if one, one way to take that is, is if we take Witt's view that, well, actually nature is good and humankind is more or less good. What if human beings, or at least that section of human being, who, that section of humanity that is warlike, what if that is the, the war in the heart of nature? That you've got nature, which is just nature, and then you have human beings who are constantly fighting and human beings are a part of nature. So they're that part of nature that is at war with itself. Yeah, because we are part of nature. Yeah, you know, and we we cannot separate ourselves from that. I'd so. like to ask some questions about how we see various characters, if that's if that's all right. Sure, you're gonna have to. I I still trying to keep all the characters straight, but we can go for it. <laughs> so I, I I I Captain Staros, who I think is my favorite character, honestly. I I would agree. I I I think uh, he and Wit are the two that kind of are on the more pacifist end of things. Um, I think I, like I said earlier, I resonated with this notion of him 
not being willing to sacrifice his men for something that, you know, it's kind of a, what was the point? His, um, his character, I feel, is framed by his prayer. Mm-hmm. The, the, and it shows him praying the night before the first day of, of the battle to take the hill. And he's praying. Um, and he, he, he begins the prayer by asking God if he, if he is there. Are you there? Let me not betray you. Let me not betray my men. In you I place my trust. Mm-hmm. And that, that to me is, is what frames his character, that he, he loves his people. And he, and he says it to Colonel Tall. I've, I've lived with these men for two years. I'm not going to order them to their deaths. They've become my family. Mm-hmm. And, and the last thing he says before he, he leaves the film is he speak, he says it in Greek. He says, it means you've been like my sons. Mm-hmm. So. And they, I think his, his people have sort of a mixed opinion of him. I think uh, some of them really like him. I think Dole, uh, the blonde haired guy uh, played by uh, uh, Dash Mihawk, uh, really likes Captain, Captain Staros and a number of others really like him. But uh, some of them don't. And I never really got this up because one of the dialogues is, is uh, old Charlie Company's always getting screwed, always. And I'll tell you whose fault it is, it's that captain of ours. How about, how about, uh, um, I don't remember, I'm having trouble remembering his name. Um, he's played by Ben, Ben Chapel, Ben Chaplin. I, I don't remember if it's Chapel or Chaplin, but he's the, the fellow who constantly thinks about his wife. Um, I, to me, I guess what I, I have a hard time thinking so much about his character as such, other than the fact that it is kind of the, the pointing to, you know, war is not just those are who are in the battle, but those back home and, and the cost that is there as well. Um, you know, it's a, it seems like there's kind of a common trope in in war of who who back home are we fighting for? Who do we, you know, what are those connections that we think of? And then um, if I remember correctly, she ends up leaving him, right? Mm-hmm. And 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 to me that breaks my heart <laughs> a little yeah. bit. I, it's understandable in some respects, but it's also it, it it's it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it. Uh, um, he he leaves. He he was an officer in the Corps of Engineers, serving in the Philippines before the war, and he leaves. Although actually, it was to his to his advantage, uh, given what happened to the Philippines uh, after Japan declared war on the United States, or after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. But uh, he 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 was an officer. He was in the Corps of Engineers. He wasn't an infantry infantryman, but because um, of his love for his wife, he decided to resign his commission. And uh, uh, he gets screwed in that regard because he uh, is sent back to the army after the war begins and he's made a private in the infantry, he's made into cannon fodder, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but he always uses her as sort of his safe place, right? His, he thinks right. of his wife when he's scared and he thinks of his wife when, when like, she's, she's his place to retreat to when he's in mortal peril. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and and yet in the end uh and yeah it break it breaks my heart she, you learn that she was fighting her own war in that she was so desperately lonely and she met an air force captain and wanted to marry him now mm-hmm. and i found myself so torn between sympathy for her and anger on his behalf yeah i mean and that's that's it that's a w- great way of saying it that you know, it's, and again, it's, it, again, that's the part of the cost of war is that it, 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 you don't want it to. And you, you tell yourself, I imagine as you're going off to war, or as a loved one is going off to war, that you remain faithful to them. And, and yet life steps in, in ways that you can't always foresee. He, he um, I think is um, one who um, begins more on wit's side, on mm-hmm. the wit staro side of things, mm-hmm. more of the of, of the hum- humanist characters, if that's the way to put it. Um, someone who isn't a naturalist, someone who isn't gung ho and 
and uh, and yet at the end um and i don't think he loses it but at the end i think he's he's shown to have lost his spark um the 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 conversation that happens between private wit and sergeant welsh um when wit says uh or when welsh or asks wit are you so you still believe in the beautiful lie day um and wit says i still see a spark on you and then after wit is dead welsh kneels at his grave and says where's your spark now it seems to me that on the one hand like um bell that's his name private bell later sergeant bell um uh is uh has a spark uh has has that light and the light is his wife um and then when it when she leaves him it's gone and so he kind of loses himself in that sense what do you <laughs> i don't know if it's it, i I, <laughs> I was thinking about the the irony of um wit wit was played by jim caviezel Mm-hmm. who played jesus in yes. <laughs> the passion of the christ is there uh, what do you I, i'm i'm sure that there's probably not any intention in that but it's just an irony there what, he, he plays a very good christ character doesn't he mm-hmm. <laughs> because wit is the christ character i was gonna i was gonna ask that do you think that they set him up as kind of the christ character of this movie I think they did. I, I'm not sure if that's intentional or not, but Wit does die sacrificing himself. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think he experiences a resurrection per se, but I, I, I think in death he keeps his spark. Because mm. I, mm-hmm. I, 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 when the sergeant asks him, where, asks his body, "Where's your spark now?" Well, I think it's still very much so there because I think Wit in the one what I what I love about Wit's character is that he never loses his idealism. Mm-hmm. I, I think he he he's wounded. Especially when he goes to see the, the 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 Sullivan Islanders and they don't they don't give him the time of day. I think that wounds him. But you know when he comes back to his to 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 the company after that, he's smiling, and he's he's looking around at how everybody's kind of playing around and just kind of shooting the breeze with each other. And he's smiling. He even has a line earlier in the film: "I love Charlie Company. They're my people." And uh, um, and he, he lets himself be wounded. And in that conversation that he then has with, with Sergeant Welsh, he asks the sergeant, you care about me, don't you? It's sort of a wounded person who's lost something asking, you, you care about me, don't you? And of course, it's clear that Sergeant Welsh really probably does, but is, is hiding from his own, his own sense of emotion and doesn't really give, I think, wit the kind of validation that he's seeking and instead says, well, so you still believe in the beautiful light, do you? And Wit looks at him and says, I still see a spark in you. So Wit never loses faith. And indeed, after he dies, he he's taken back to when he's swimming in the in in the ocean with with uh, the Solomon Islanders and this, you know, this beautiful moment where it, it's sort of a it is the kind of death that he wanted, because in, in the very first part of the film, he says um, he, he remembers uh, his mother dying and and how how horrid she looked as she was dying, and how she he didn't find anything beautiful or uplifting about going back to God. But then he found the immortality and the calm stoicism of meeting death without fear. And I think I, I read the last scene where he finally does die um, as he he did it. He he met death calmly, bravely. As a friend. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. He embraced death as a friend. Mm-hmm. Which, so one of the things that you had talked about is, and we've talked about that before in this, is the contrast of, you know, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me versus kind of the ex- peaceful acceptance and into your hands, I commend my spirit. This definitely falls into the, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Yes. It's a look kind of death. Death. Um, so another thought I had, and it kind of goes back to the, I'm jumping around topics here, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I'm thinking about, you know, that taking of the hill, um, the myth of redemptive violence keeps mm. coming back to my mind. Would it have made a difference? So they got, they got hammered pretty hard in this. And ultimately I'm trying to remember if they actually managed to take the they did. hill, you know, and was it worth it? 
you know, Doesn't was, was it worth it? And, and I, and I love how one of the characters says it's all property. It was, sorry. You know, it's, it's all property. Mm -hmm. I don't think the film speculates on whether it was worth it. I think again, you Colonel tall certainly seemed to think so. And I think Colonel tall managed to convince captain Staros that it was worth it. And that Staros was in the wrong line of work. And he needed to get out of there if he wasn't willing to, to sacrifice his men's life. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't think the film says whether it was worth it or not. And I, I don't think the film says whether the violence is ultimately redemptive. I think the film focuses in on the, 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 the damage that the violence does to these people, whether or not it's ultimately redemptive or ultimately necessary at the end of the day. It, it still does the same damage. Yeah. And that's and that's the thing. That's why I tend to be more of a pacifist because sure. to me that damage leads me to say mm, most of the time, most of the time, it's maybe not. What do we think about Sergeant Welsh, Sean Penn's character? I'm I'm trying to remember kind of some specific scenes of him i guess am i right in thinking he feels like he's still trying to figure some of this out too and trying to figure out where he lands on things Is i think that a fair well I, I see i i think he gives off this facade of toughness um he's 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 a more sympathetic version of colonel tall in in the sense that um um he he does he, he does come down on the side of naturalism like he believes that um, he says it to, to wit in this world, a man himself is nothing and there ain't no world but this one, just this rock. And um, that's where wit's uh, religion comes out. He says, I've seen another world. Sometimes I thought it was just my imagination, but I've seen it. And then he says, well, you're seeing things I never will. And, and he says, we're living in a world that's blown itself to hell as fast as anyone can arrange it. And all a person can do in that case is just close himself off and find an island for himself. That's Sergeant Welsh. And on, on the one hand, there's that sort of facade of toughness, but he's also the one who ran out to save that soldier who was screaming and shouting and, and to give him morphine. You remember that scene? Yeah. And, you know, so it's very clear, I think, that Sergeant Welsh deeply cares and he's running from his, the fact that he cares uh, into a, you know. Yeah. And I think that's the challenge that, um private wit and the others kind of put to him is you care more than you let on here yeah you know and i think that would be almost harder because the energy to shove those emotions down takes more than to acknowledge and admit them i think wit's death hit him the hardest because yeah. i wonder if he was putting his hope in wit because wit never gave up on his idealism and when he knelt down and at Wit's body and said, where's your spark now? I feel like there's just this guttural pain that he's letting mm -hmm. out. This sense of, uh, of everything that I hoped for, I hoped for in you, 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 the Christ character, you, I, if you had made it, if you had, had made it. We through, had hoped that he would save our people. Yeah. On yeah. the, on the road yes. to Emmaus. <laughs> yes. And then unfortunately, the film doesn't really come back with a resurrection moment, a um, yeah. little bit with um, with uh, um, Wits. And I think that's intentional on the film's part. I think mm -hmm. it wants us to sit with just the the pain of it. It's you a know, Holy Saturday think, film. Yeah. And that's and I think, you know, in the contrasting it with other war films and you call it an anti-war film um, in the in the sense of. You know, I think it, it too many war films do try and end on that positive, redemptive moment of, yay, we win, rah, rah, we're going to go back and kick their butts. Pearl Harbor ends with them going on this special mission to bomb as much as they can. Whereas here, we're just left. It, it's really a a down note that we're set that we're left on and i think that's intentional and i also think that's i i respect it for that you know i think sometimes there are just some things that we need to be left to sit in the pain and the discomfort and that's kind of part of the point of the movie 
I agree. I also think it is interesting that there's one character that you meet twice in the film, one at the very beginning before they land and the other as they're on the landing craft heading back to the ship after the battle is over uh, and right before the film ends. Um, he's the he, he's the guy who identifies himself as Edward P. Train, right? And he's he's talking about he's talking to Sergeant Welsh about how scared he is. And he's like, I, I just can't help how, how damn scared I am. I I want to own an automobile when I someday. Right. And mm -hmm. and and uh, he says uh, this war ain't going to be the end of me. There's only two things you can count on. It's dying and the Lord. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, what you learn, what I didn't realize until this time that I watched it a lot of times you hear in the inner monologue uh the specific soldiers that are you know you're you, that you're looking at like you'll hear ba bell's inner monologue you'll hear wits inner monologue or sergeant tall or, or uh, colonel talls or sergeant welsh but a lot of times you hear a, a sort of countryish voice that and it's he's the very first one right that what's this war in the heart of nature it's him it's train yeah who narrates the whole film you yeah. know, and you only see him one time at the very beginning and then another time at the end. And at the end, he's sort of if there's a if there's a resurrection moment, it's 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 what he says as he's explaining to I think it was Bell. It's like uh, I'm by no means old, but I'm older now. And and mm -hmm. he sort of he, he, he talks about how for him this whole experience was kind of a coming of age. And and uh, now that I've seen how horrible life can be, I'm ready to start living life good. Yeah. No. Well, and, and that's, I mean, I think that experience in war, again, not having been there, I think that seems to be true of many. You know, they go off as kids, but they come on back as very grown old souls. Um, the other thing with this, too, so similar, you know, there's the what's this uh, war in the middle of nature, but then there's what is this root of evil and then later, the contrasting question, what is this root of love? And mm. there's kind of this love and evil are, are compared and contrasted as well. What do you make about that? Bell's character says it best about love. Who lit this flame in us? No war mm -hmm. can put it out, conquer it. And yet, unfortunately, um, for him, it is conquered. But I think for Wit and maybe for Train, it isn't conquered. It, it, the mm -hmm. spark still lives. Um um, I, I, I think that the, I, I don't know if the film gives an answer to, to theodicy, gives, gives a, the film doesn't really have a theodicy, it treats, it treats evil as a fact, mm -hmm. right, and it could be a fact that is built into the very heart of nature itself, the war in the heart of nature, the, the not a glitch, the, but a feature. Right, the the cruelty in, in nature, right, that, that, that Colonel Paul talks mm -hmm. about, or it could be, um, that uh, um, nature is fine, nature is good, humans are kind of messed up. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't know, I, I, think, I think the audience is left to really wrestle with that. Uh, that, that there is no solution to the film. There is no, there's nowhere that the film comes down on. There's, there's, there's one line where um, you hear Sergeant Welsh talking in his inner monologue it's after he had um had that one of his last beautiful conversation with private wit he's looking at private wit smiling or not he, excuse me sleeping he's looking at private wit as he's sleeping it's just before wit dies and his monologue says one man looks at a at a, at a, at a dying bird and just sees unanswered suffering another man looks at the same bird and feels the glory he can see something smiling through it and i, I think the audience is left just to well, which one are you? There are advantages and disadvantages of both. And um, I, I think, yeah. Yeah. So are we ready to think about, if you were to preach on this, what would you, what would you preach? Hmm. I, I wonder if I would preach about trauma mm. because I, I and, and the fact that trauma causes moral injury mm -hmm. and that the film is about moral injury. It's about how violence affects people, whether mm -hmm. or not the violence is, is good. Well, there's no good violence, whether or not the violence is necessary. 
right? It still affects people. War does not ennoble people. It poisons their souls. It turns them into dogs. And that is true whether the war is just or not. Mm -hmm. And we can go from there into this idea of like thinking about how to manage the trauma that we experience in our day-to-day -day lives. How, how do we avoid it turning us into dogs and turning us into, into um, brutes? I think I would um, use the passage, the wolf shall lie down with the lamb and the child, you know, and, and, and creation will be at peace. You know, what, what would it look like for creation to be at peace? And, and of course, there's an invitation to acknowledge that trauma piece. Um, you know, again, if it, it's no one's necessarily an entire pacifist in this movie, but, you know, what would that look like? What does what does it mean to practice peace? You know, I, I feel this film is I, I asked you right after um, um, um right after the film was over, I asked you, so what do you think? Because this is actually, this is my favorite movie. Thin Red Line is absolutely my favorite movie. And I think you said something, well, it's very deep. Uh, and I think it is very deep. But I notice here that of all of the films that we've talked about, save perhaps The Family Stone, this is the one that we've used the least amount of open theological terminology discussing. Because I wonder if this film doesn't really lend itself very well to preaching a sermon or, or talking about the theology. Because, and, and I think it's not so much that theology isn't there, it very much so is, but the film presents itself as a conflict. Mm -hmm. The film doesn't take a stand. It presents, it presents itself dialectically. And so the, mm -hmm. the, the audience is really left to, to come to their own conclusions, but the film does not come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, I think the, are you there, God? Yes, is is the question of the movie. And so therefore, it makes sense of that, you know, our, we're struggling, where is God in this? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's, that's an inherent question of war is, is God really in the midst of war? Mm. You know, which is why I, I resonate so much with Father Mulcahy in MASH. Mm -hmm. and, and some movies just have that kind of chaplain character or whatever. And it's because there's the reminder, you know, where is God in this? With those who suffer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and, and I think is, is God there trying to whisper in the ears of people, don't do this. This isn't worth it. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it strikes me that so many wars come down to either fights over property or over ideology yeah you know that's that's pretty much what wars come down to well we thank you for joining us today on our pastor and a priest walk into a movie theater discussion of a thin red line um, if you want to support the work that we are doing you can do that in a few ways at this point we are as of recording we are doing our indiegogo campaign and um, are working on setting up a website. If you want to contribute on a regular basis, we are doing the Patreon thing. And so you have different tiers and options and ways of supporting that. Um, the best thing you can do, even if you're not able to give financially, is to share, review, like, subscribe, um, get the word out there and tell folks about it and then participate in our discussion groups and forums and um, just keep up on everything that's going on. We are so thankful to our editor, Wesley, and to Gail Gallagher, who provides our music, and um, are so thankful for all of you who participate in this conversation with us. With that, we will see you next time.